All right, I will notice that we call this session tool, visualization tools anyone can use, and there should be a huge asterisk on that uh, because it may take weeks, months, years, decades, a whole career of training to use these tools, but um, yeah. All right, um, the video looks good. All right, this is gonna, I'm gonna go over my time here. There's so many tools to talk about, but I want to give you an overview of the visualization pipeline that we use. Um, and it's a visualization pipeline I use in what I create, what I call cinematic scientific visualizations. Uh, this is my PhD thesis, okay? Um, it appeared in the IMAX film Cosmic Voyage. I get to say that my PhD thesis was nominated for an Academy Award, yes! Um, but this says I started on a big scale with my visualization stuff. I've done lots and lots of visualizations for Hubble, uh, for press releases and stuff. I got to work on the IMAX Hubble 3D film, uh, science advisor and visualization supervisor and such. We got to do a symphonic film with Eric Whitaker that we showed last time AAS was in Seattle. Um, and one of our sequences actually got used in the art house film by Claire Denis, High Life starring Robert Pattinson and Juliette Binoche. Okay, so I will refine this to say this is sort of an astrophysicist uh, visualization pipeline. You will not need every step that I outline here. Well, some of you will, um, but very few of you will need them. Pick and choose the ones. I'm gonna emphasize the ones that I think most of this room will use more, okay? Such as things uh, talking about data. Uh, for images, we uh, used Hubble Galaxies Cross Space and Time, an IMAX film that features the Great Observatory's Origins Deep Survey, 627 megapixels of visual goodness. This is the press release image that actually went out of the goods image. But if I look in detail, I can find all that mosaicing artifacts that you didn't notice in the press release image. None of you noticed that, okay? We noticed it when we tried to put it to IMAX. So we had to go then clean it up and make it look really good. If you're gonna do visualization, you, you, it has a higher standard than what you're doing for your science, okay? Tons of image processing software. I use GIMP. I also use Image Magic from the command line because I'm I'm a geek programmer type guy. Um, I learned about um, Gimmick today. Uh, well, actually, yesterday when I went through Nancy's slides, I was like, oh yeah, I remember. I heard had heard about it. Uh, got Photoshop. PixInsight is a wonderful little uh, tool. It has a wonderful plugin, Star Exterminator. I'm going to show you in a second. Fitz Liberator that Lars will tell you about. Uh, DS9, JS9, all, all sorts of image processing out there, okay? Uh, one thing I wanna highlight is this piece of software. This is a plugin for PixInsight and Photoshop. Starting with the object on the left, they use a neural network to remove every single star and they get the object, the image on the right. Unbelievable, okay? It is amazing. David, it, 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 all right, we found this uh, and it doesn't do a perfect job, okay? We have to remove stars for our visualizations. It doesn't do a perfect job. But oh my God, it's a great start, okay? Um, saves a lot of work, okay. Data, um, catalogs. Let's say, hey, I just wanna make a cool visualization of the Orion stars and spin them around in 3D. You'd think that would be pretty easy. No, it's got, if you're gonna do a good visualization, it's a little more complex than that. So you get the Harparcos catalog, okay? You supplement that with the Yale Bright Star catalog because Harparcos really isn't fully complete. You come up with a visualization model. We chose the uh, Akira Fuji -E images, and there's how the brightness of the stars grow. We model those with Gaussians and exponentials, a combination of it, but hey, I'm a geek, so I have a 13-parameter model of how my stars bloom so I can really match them. Plus, remember, you've also got to get the colors right, okay, um, and transfer from OBFGKM to actual colors. You see the sun isn't yellow, as all the public believes. It's really this peachy white. Um, and then you can produce the image on the right from the catalog uh, to try and match the image on the left, which is the photographic, okay? Um, so there's a lot more work into it, but you need to do this because you need to calculate the, dis the, the brightness of every star at every frame of your movie so that you can get your one over R squared dimming, okay? If you just make an artist do it, they're gonna cre create a sphere for a star and it's gonna look the same no matter what distance it is from you, okay? So if we do that, then you can see that as we go through our spinning around of, the of it, the stars get brighter or fainter as opposed to when you do that. 
And that's kind of cool, right? Um, but furthermore, you can though then go when you do an illustration for a planet possibly around Fomalot, you can in the background put in the Sun, Sirius, and Procyon. Actually, that's real data in the background. That's exactly what it would look like from Fomalot. And Ravelard and I are the only ones who know it, but we 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 know it and we like it. Okay. So data processing software, lots of uh, stuff. Basically, Perl, C, uh, C++, C fits IO for interface. Uh, IRAF, I don't know what anybody uses that anymore, but that's uh, most people use Python. Okay. I don't actually use Python. I'm a Perl guy. Sorry. Um, but, you know, it works really well for those to it. IDL, um, stuff like that. Now, that also works into something that I will refer to as data visualization software. Okay, versus data processing, uh, which is more code based, but things like you're going to get talks about glue worldwide telescope and open space coming up in this session. But things like Carta for doing data cubes or YT for handling volume volumetric data um, and Firefly, which I found uh, the other day uh, for handling particles interactivity. Okay, uh, for just doing your data visualization, I think of these as things that are going to explore, let you understand things, um, but not ones I can then render and turn into a, a cinematic fly through uh, for what I do. Okay. All right. Simulations. Um, we all remember no Supernova 1987A and that ring around it that brightened over the course of 20 years. Well, there was a uh, visualization, a, a simulation that actually uh, had the blast wave go out and hit the ring. Um, and they wanted me to visualize it for a press release. Uh, turns out it's an AMR simulation, adaptive mesh refinement. Big boxes down to very, very small boxes, very complex data set. I've never dealt with it before, so I had to figure out how to do an AMR data transform. Uh, fortunately, it's HDF5 data format, and I could then parse that, pull that down, pull it into something that I'm more used to because I did smooth particle hydrodynamics for my thesis, uh, pull it into particle data, render it with my software, um, and then you get uh, as able to create that visualization for the press release that has the blast wave going out, hitting the ring, causing it to brighten, um, and illustrates the 30 years of uh, since 1987A uh, and gives it to us in 3D. So sometimes you have to really just go outside your own um, comfort level, all right? Uh, so I've often had to use Gadget, uh, HDF5, and then a variety of C and Fortran uh, programming in order to they will pull in the simulation data and then move it into a visualization realm. Then after you've got your data in there, you've got to model it, okay? Uh, for the Hubble Ultra Deep Field, uh, we wanted to extract all the galaxies in there, about 5,500 that we had a good redshift for. Um, so we use source extractor to pull out individual postage stamps, okay? Uh, and you get to those postage stamps and there's multiple galaxies in one postage stamp. So the segmentation map from source extractor allows us to isolate those individual galaxies, okay? Um, then you've got to clean them. Again, as I said, higher standard for visualizations, you've got to clean out all that noise around these galaxies. You develop processes to do that automatically because you're not going to do it by hand for 5,000 galaxies, okay? You got to do batch processing. You got to think in this, okay? So then we take those images and the data and my 3D modeling is actually done in Perl, which outputs something called MelScript uh, that goes into Maya. Uh, the MelScript, this is create nodes of a, a mesh and a polyplane and the orient constraint, and then the shader that goes on top of that, blah, blah, blah. You probably haven't dealt with this before, but this is the internals of the Maya program, the Maya code, all right? It writes out this million line text file that you read into Maya and then boom, before I, without doing anything in Maya, I now have my, uh, this is like 10, 000, 11, 000 galaxies uh, in Maya. The, the, the dark square is the uh, ultra deep field, okay? Turn sideways, cameras on the left, you can see it's that big long pyramid of things, okay? You're not going to use an interactive 3D tool to place galaxies one by one 5,000 times, okay? So coding, scripting, uh, et cetera, batch processing, all right. So in, the, in terms of modeling software, we generally use Maya and Houdini at our shop. Uh, Robert said he's starting to use Blender a lot more. He used to use Lightwave, uh, their various 3D packages. Um, for those of you who are coders, there are Python API APIs to most of these packages, okay? 
If we're going to do a lot of, of things, um, you got to be able to use those APIs, to create the, the 3D uh, that way. I'll also note Shape, uh, which is a code written by Wolfgang Steffen uh, when he was down at, at Mexico. Fantastic piece of software. He has now commercialized it um, and now has this company called Ilumbra.com. Um, and at Ilumbra, they have uh, created this, which I just wanted to highlight. This is a visualization using shape of the um, Southern Ring Nebula from JWST. So a web image in 3D um, that, that is, they did a very good job of creating a model of things like that. Um, unfortunately, Ilumbra only gets used through the Illuvia software viewer uh, and such. So it's not terribly useful for planet, for, uh, it's only useful, it's, it's marketed to planetariums. It's not terribly useful for research, unfortunately. Uh, and such like that, okay? That's kind of cool. Um, sculpted decoupage. Well, we did billboards. Now we're gonna do multi-layered billboards. And uh, so this is a decoupage box with multi-layers in it. And if you sort of tilt it, you get that 3D effect. We do that digitally. And we're gonna do it for the star cluster Westerlund 2. So here is our digital model within Maya. Um, and you can see that there are multiple layers in here. Uh, various things, and you can see that those layers are then sculpted to give a 3D effect. All right, so your uh, the camera is up at the top of, of this of this Christmas tree, looking down, and we we sculpt the layers to give it a, a 3D feel as we as we fly through it. We also have the stars um, and various, and here's our full Christmas tree of this effect. And you say that is so cheap and sleazy. How could this possibly work for 3D? Oh my God, it works so well. Okay. Um, so here is our, yeah, here's our model build sequence here of this. Um, and you can see this are the, you know, 20 or so layers that we put in to build up Westerlund 2. Um, and when you fly into it, it really fools the eye much better than it has any right to. Okay. All right. So one of the most important things that astronomers don't do is camera. We tend to just lock down our camera, XY projection, XZ projection, YZ projection. Um, and that's, sorry, that, that's great for, for research. It's boring for anything cinematic. Um, we fly our cameras through, we let them to spin and rotate and do all sorts of fun things. Uh, in Maya, these are the camera tracks at X, Y, and Z. And the most important thing about being able to do real camera moves is being able to control your tangents, how you flow into those inflection points and out of those inflection points. This is a really simple camera move. I've got camera moves that go up and down and all over the place and being able to adjust those tangents to get a smooth camera move because it's visually obvious when you don't have a smooth camera move, okay? Um, I would show this one. Uh, this is the galaxy collision simulations versus observations. We're getting to the exact right point here so that I can cross fade to the Hubble image that looks at the, uh, that, that galaxy collision and then being able to move to a different point to match another one thing, all right? Uh, in terms of camera tools, each 3D program has its own set. I love Maya. I really love their, their camera tool, um, but we can export. Robert and I had to export from Maya to Lightwave and we went the wrong thing. I've also written a simple one in Fortran. So if you can imagine in your head, you might be able to write your own, but I really would let other people do this for you. Uh, rendering, okay. So the top is the model from a, a, a galaxy collision. Those are just the points. The bottom is the render. When you take each of those points and you render it as an SPH uh, splat with a Gaussian, uh, uh, with, a, with the proper uh, smoothing kernel, you actually see the detail of it, right? Um, again, the 3D modeling programs have their own renderer. We use the Maya software renderer all the time. Um, we don't have to go to the really expensive ones like like Pixar's Render Man or the um, uh, the ray tracing ones. Uh, it's just not worth it for what we do. However, science can also need a special purpose renderer because this is what a BMRT did uh, for a cosmology simulation. It took 29 hours per frame. 29 hours per frame. I rewrote. I wrote my own code. Uh, I got it down to 27 minutes. Okay. Yeah, that's a reason for writing your own bloody code. I never, I didn't want to, but I had to. So now I'm a practitioner of cosmic pointillism uh, because my code is called pointillism. I draw millions to billions of, of, of splats on screen uh, in a pointillistic manner and I can do it fast and efficient 
because I'm doing one thing and one thing only. I'm not trying to do Star Wars. I'm just doing my, sci my, my science visualization and that works. The other thing to think about is if you, will you need a render farm, okay? For IMAX Hubble 3D, we used every CPU in the building we could get our hands on. Um, I kept them running as much as possible. Here's that spreadsheet to track which sequence was running on which machine and which frames, et cetera. Um, you might need this, okay? The important point is that um, you do your test renders. You got to anticipate what you need, okay? For my recent uh, Stefan's Quintet visualization, I got to, oh, I should render, be able to render this over the weekend. And then I realized, no, I have to do it in 4K60. Um, yes, we're done. Okay, so last thing to think through since we, since we are done is to teach you about, talk about layers and compositing um, that when you take layers, we render the visible, we can render the ultraviolet, layer it on top. We can take the alpha layer on top of that and the x-rays and layered on top of that. When you think about Photoshop and you have multiple layers that you composite, do the same with video, okay? You can do a lot in composite that can cheat, okay? We'll fix it in post. That's what we always say, all right? We'll fix it in post. Um, we tend to think of doing all in, all in camera, all right? So let me get to my, my final slide. Uh, where are we? Here we go. Okay, there we go. Oh, okay. So. So your visualization pipeline, uh, I didn't get to talk about music, but music plays an incredible, enormous emotional role in what you do. All right, so you get, it, you get your data, you're gonna figure out how you're gonna model it. You're gonna have to create a nice, interesting camera move for it. You're then you're gonna render all that. You're gonna take those frames, composite them together, work them into, in, into your sequence, add some uh, good emotional music. Um, and uh, maybe you won't use all this, but, that's what you need for cinematic scientific visualizations. And if you find this really cool, I got a job opening in my group and uh, it'll be announced in the next month, okay? So send me an email if uh, you're interested in stuff like this. Thank you very much. All right, who's up next? Lars. Lars is up next, Lars, yay! So I didn't go over as, as much as I thought I would go over. <laughs> Knowing, of course, that I would go over. All right. Ladies and gentlemen, Lars Christians. Lars, you have 10 minutes. I'll give you a few minutes. Thanks. Hi, everyone. I'm Lars. Nice to meet you. Um, I'm going to say a lot of technical stuff here. Um, take home message, Google Fits Liberator. If you have Fits files and you would like to work on them in Photoshop or GIMP, as a TIFF file or something else. Um, it's a great tool, it's easy to use, and the rest will be a little bit more technical. So um, like Frank said, I'm starting to feel a bit like an old fart. Um, yeah. Um, almost 20 years ago, Robert and I, we sat in, I think the first Astrovis, I think it was at STSCI in 2004, and we were sort of uh, complaining, ranting um, about uh, IRAF uh, for doing uh, pretty pictures. Uh, so from the step of having clean, nice FITS files, one per filter uh, observations, and turning them into something nice and pretty that can be printed and used in textbooks. Uh, very cumbersome. You had this uh, one-line interface. Uh, oodles of experimentation was needed, lots of time wasted. So we came up with this idea. We wanted an interactive tool. And that became then the Fitz Liberator uh, Photoshop plugin. Um, and we released it actually six um, months later, which uh, was quite phenomenal. Um, it went through some you know, versions and we ended up um, with version three, which became standalone uh, outside Photoshop to do these uh, pretty pictures in uh, collaboration. We then made a, version four, um, and it became the IPAC, uh, so Noir Lab IPAC ESA STSCI CFA Photoshop um, Liberator. And now, sorry, Fitz Liberator. And now we have then version 4.1 ready for release, and we think it'll go out mid-February. Um, the um, Fitz Liberator 4 was a big step. Um, 
it's a completely revamped standalone application, modern libraries, faster. You could install it on modern OSs and had a new uh, interface. And also what is important for uh, some of us, a command line interface. So if you wanna do the same thing many, many times over, as Frank also has talked about, then you can script it and just let it run in the background. Um, so it had 64-bit uh, support and, and all these things, open source code, which turned out also to be really, really useful. There's a whole community of people looking into the code and providing feedback. Um, and we then took that feedback about a year ago and decided to make one uh, kind of final version maybe, because the next version probably will be chat GBT, you know, make astronomical image and boom or something, right? Um, and it has uh, Debian Linux support. There's a copy button. So you can kind of take the secret sauce of what you're sitting doing on the interface, and then you have it ready to go for the command line interface. It has support for really big images and really, really big images. So five gigapixels we ran on this the other day. So more than you actually have memory for. Um, and uh, the community was very helpful providing inputs. There were some inconsistencies in the code, some bugs were found and those were fixed. And it's now much more stable and uh, supports even more FITS files as some compressed FITS and Mac M1 support, et cetera. So the idea of um, the FITS liberator is to take these very uh, nuanced astronomical images um, Robert talked about the galaxies, right? With very, very bright centers. And there's a lot of faint stuff out uh, in, in the corners. It's a bit like sitting in a concert hall. You can hear everything from the faintest to the very loudest stuff. And astronomical images are like that. But if you're sitting in your car with your stereo, you might not be able to hear all that. So we kind of have to compress that dynamic range down so that there is a black point where you kind of cut off and there's a white point where you cut off and then you make a mathematical function to um, uh, transform from those grayscales into something that's actually visible and can be printed. And this is kind of the bread and butter of what many of us do. Down below here, you see this uh, new co copy button and um, uh, that is pretty much uh, the concept of the uh, FITS liberator. Um, I'll just go through uh, real quick what actually happens when you take um, a sort of deep field uh, um, of, of galaxies and you open the FITS file. At first, you may look at it with a kind of linear transform and you see just a lot of dots. And these are just the very centers of galaxies. And you can then put on, for instance, an inverse um, hyperbolic sine function, which Robert um, was advocating for a very long time. Um, some people use power laws, but it suddenly becomes very visible. There's a ton of stuff going on. You do that, uh, you remove all the artifacts that's done by hand, um, by uh, proficient people. Um, we work with a fantastic Indian guy called Adil. He um, removes blemishes from astronomical images and also from art shoots. So men, women with interesting sort of garments and they are very often need a little bit touching. It's very much the same kind of thing you need to do. We're very cautious about doing things ethically correct. So we never add or subtract things that are out there in, in nature, but um, uh, we do want to focus on what is in nature. We do this for each of the filters, RGB or whatever have you in your astronomical data sets. And then that's composited into an RGB image. You then keep tweaking to some extent in the tonal um, range and the frequencies you reduce the noise and you end up with a final image. So FITS Liberator, Google it and mid-February is the release of the new version. Come on. Oh, right. I forgot the <laughs> All right. Uh, you want to pick, have any questions? Yeah, we have. All right. Time. So we have time for a question. Crazy. Uh, does anybody have a question about Fitz Liberator?
Okay. Uh, it, it's pretty self-explanatory. I think it, 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 it. All right, let's try and get back a little bit more on time. Thank you, Lars. Up oh, question. Uh, uh, I'll repeat the question. All right, so the question was, do you recommend using JS9 like for, for that they're using for Astrophoto challenges or try to use Fitz Liberator? So JS9 is amazing because it's online. People can click and none of all this installing and whatnot. So it's a huge, hugely different kind of entry point. You can do it with a classroom. You can jump right in. You don't need administrator access or Mac or Linux box, it's just there, right? So I would definitely say that's a great choice uh, done by Universe of Learning. Uh, sorry, just a reminder on behalf of the AAS that we, in all of our meeting spaces, we are required to wear masks. So just a reminder that that, that is the, the norm that's been set up by the AAS. Thank you. Yeah. All right, so let's see. Except when we're talking. Except when we're talking. I don't know if the AAS approves of that, but we're doing it. Okay, David, you know what you're doing? I, I think so. I don't I know what so. you're doing, but we're on screen share, so you can see it's up there. Thank You'll be on there. Ladies and gentlemen, David Weigel. Thank you so much. All right, thank you all. Let's see, how do we, that button, that button's great. Okay, Ooh, but my face is in the wrong place, so we'll move that somewhere else. All right, good deal. Uh, so good afternoon, everyone. As you said, my name is David Weigel, and I am uh, perhaps in a little bit different position. There we go, let's try that. Um, I'm in perhaps a little bit different position than many of you in that I am the planetarium director at the Intuitive Planetarium at the US Space and Rocket Center in Huntsville, Alabama, which is a very long title. And uh, I also work with Worldwide Telescope which is uh, funded currently through the American Astronomical Society and do a lot of data visualization uh, for them. So I want to talk to you about Worldwide Telescope and show you uh, a variety of uh, some of the new tools that we've created using Worldwide Telescope uh, that are perhaps useful to you in a variety of ways for some, some quick and contextual visualization of your data. Um, so to start, uh, you're probably familiar uh, with what we're looking at, but you probably um, haven't seen it quite like this. Uh, this is imagery of the Carina Nebula from JWST, of course, and uh, this is all from the NearCam instrument. And uh, we're actually looking at all of the filters uh, from NearCam uh, that were combined to make that beautiful uh, PR release image that we saw back in July. Uh, when I saw it, my mind was completely blown, and I haven't started uh, talking again till today. So it's been nice to get back. Um, but what's really cool about this, uh, this data is is very big. It's very big as the, the FITS imagery. And so you're looking at uh, maybe five or six gigs per filtered image in here. So to play around with that interactively um, on your computer is, is a little bit cumbersome, perhaps, especially if you're trying to do all of them at the same time. And we can do this uh, pretty, pretty simply uh, using some of the, the Python tools that uh, have been created to collaborate with Worldwide Telescope. Um, so if you use Python, uh, it's as simple as within Anaconda doing uh, two lines of code to make this happen. All you have to do is download the picture, the fits image that you're interested in. Uh, you need to download the package Toasty. You can do that from a variety of places, maybe go for Conda Forge. So that would be uh, conda install dash c conda dash forge toasty line one line two is toasty view and then your image name and then in about 75 seconds it will tile all that up and view it in our worldwide telescope research app which lets you view it in context of the sky so you're thinking why is the sky black all around it uh, what we're doing right here is viewing this in context of the spitzer glimpse uh, 360 imagery, which is really useful for this, but we could uh, change up our background imagery if we so desired. I think it's covered by this. I won't. I won't do it. We'll just. We'll just down this for now. But you can change your imagery. Oh my goodness! If you get away from what you needed to get to, 
you can refocus by clicking on this little locator button and you can see where we are in context of the sky. Um, you might also like to crossfade. That's a nice thing to do. And what we're actually doing right here is crossfading against these various different um, filters that we've set up. And so uh, we could actually toggle all of these uh, to be hidden. Uh, the way the hierarchy works is that whatever's on the bottom is in front, top is underneath. So now we can compare against the Glimpse 360 data. You can see all these cool like protoplanetary jets in here. You can do similar things to like DS9 or Fitz Liberator. You can play with uh, color mapping. You can play with uh, the stretch if you so desire. You can set high and low cutoffs, et cetera. And so uh, while this isn't um, a tool to process your imagery, it is a tool to view it quickly and in context of the sky and also share it with people. If you want to post these tiled images somewhere on the internet, then you can create a link and literally as simple as create link to current view. It's probably something a bit unwieldy, but you can copy that into um, a chat or something and share that with whoever you like. And that's a neat thing. Okay, so that's thing one, still tracking? Awesome. Okay, oh, not tracking, cool. Uh, the package is called Toasty, T-O-A-S-T-Y. I'll link to it in the Slack channel as well. Okay, so um, this is more of the, the research app. It's a slimmed down version of Worldwide Telescope. Actually, by raise of hands, um, has anyone used Worldwide Telescope before? Oh, nobody. Okay, this is completely different than the talk yesterday. I should have led with that. So uh, we'll go to ooh, World Cup. That could be fun, um, but not for now. Let's go to this one. Okay, so the so Worldwide Telescope is a visualization engine um, that is fantastic in very many ways. Uh, this is what the user interface looks like. There's a lot going on in here. You can view imagery and context of the sky. This talk is not about showing you how to use this, so we can talk offline if you want. Okay, so um, the research app is sort of the slimmed down version of the user interface that is useful for these more specific uh, experiences. And um, recently, um, I know Kim Arcand was talking about going viral with um, sonification. And uh, we went viral this summer when JWST released its imagery, uh, largely in part uh, thanks to Alyssa Goodman. Um, I posted a bunch of links to this feverishly, but no one follows me on Twitter. People do follow her. So she posted a, a quick video. And as a result, uh, about a million people played with exploring JWST imagery in context of the sky within the first week or so. And in terms of impressions, we hit somewhere between 100 to 250 million impressions in the first couple of weeks, um, simply because when you see a beautiful picture like this, it's awesome. But how big is it? That's a pretty cool thing. So uh, what we have right here is a, a quick viewer to pick any picture uh, that JWST has released so far that can be viewed against the background sky easily. Does anyone have a favorite? Three seconds, two, one, southern ring. Oh no, tarantula, okay. <laughs> tarantula nebula, very cool. Uh, the background data set right here is the unwise all sky survey. Um, our internet is catching up here. And uh, we picked that because it is uh, comparable infrared bands uh, to what JWST is looking at. And this tarantula nebula picture is very big. And this is the full resolution imagery, and it will tile in as fast as your internet will allow. And again, you can do fun things like crossfade. That's a neat thing. And you can also change your background imagery as well. So uh, perhaps you don't like unwise. Instead, you want something else. We can look at uh, perhaps a, a visible light option of this. It's pretty blown out. So uh, maybe that was a bad choice for me to pick, but you get the idea. Um, so. Uh, the next the next step of this interactive is to have a little bit more uh, description uh, in here. That is something I'll be working on in the next like day. And uh, we should have a new version of this released in the next day or so that will be continually updated this week as we hopefully get a lot more data from JWC uh, announced. So uh, I'll link to that as well in the chat and you can share that and explore uh, as much as you like. And I think uh, the big the big takeaway uh, that I want you to have for this is that 
Um, something like this, I think, is extremely useful to curate for your own data if you have uh, especially uh, astro imagery, because it allows, one, for you, a sense of perspective as to, you know, in the grand scheme of things, what's, what's going on around. Um, it allows for multi-wavelength comparisons, which is neat, or multi-filter comparisons. And uh, as an outreach tool, this is fantastic in, in just, you know, engaging the community that you're trying to well, engage with and give them a chance for continued um, exploration and learning both while you're explaining it and then after the fact as well. So in our planetarium, we will pull something up spectacular like the Pillars of Creation um, by JWST on our 67 foot diameter dome and it looks amazing. And we'll also pull up a QR code that links out to an interactive to where they can explore this in the dome themselves on their phone and then take that home with them and continue exploring with their family, friends, or whoever, or by themselves, for that matter, uh, after the fact. And it's something that we see a lot of uh, good throughput on, on those clicks. So um, I'm happy to collaborate with any of you if you have data and want to explore that. Um, I'll be at the WWT booth, Worldwide Telescope booth, uh, all week, or you can find me today, or you can send me some sort of message to get in touch with me. I think that's all I've got. Any Great. questions? Questions? Okay. Easy enough. Worldwide Telescope has been around for almost 20 years now. Uh, since 2000, 2008, 2007, 2008? It was, it, was, it was like 2005 or so, I first remember. Eight. You didn't believe me, but I said eight, the right eight, answer. Eight. You, you know better than I, I just remember when Curtis first uh, showed, showed it to us. Perfect. Thank you. Thanks, David. All right. So next up, Jackie. I look good? All right, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, Hello, everybody. We've had such a quiet room. Uh, I'm kind of curious. It's quiet in here, and it's sometimes nice to understand who's in the audience. Since I'm not, I've been trying to figure it out, but I can't because no one's asking questions. So, questions for you guys. How many people in here have ever been to a planetarium? Oh, nice. Okay. How many people have ever been to the Hayden Planetarium? Okay, how many people have been in a planetarium where you saw something that wasn't like the space show or the like, oh, so some live presentations. I'm not gonna count some of the front of the room here, <laughs> but some of the back of the room. Okay, what I'm gonna talk to you guys about is something that's been a personal dream of mine for a while, and that is using planetariums as kind of our extra arm of doing astrophysics research. And that's why the title of this talk is Collaborative Astrophysics in Research in a Planetarium. And this is something special that we are trying. I'm not going to say that this can be done currently at every single planetarium across the planet, but possibly where essentially you can use the planetarium as almost your extra monitor in some ways and be able to sit there as if you like say you were a paleontologist and you got to fly to Namibia or something where they get to do field work and they get to dig for bones and they get to look around and they can see like a volcano that's dormant that probably had something to do with their specimens. You can do the exact same thing with your colleagues within the planetarium. So this image here, which, and I kind of got an intro, but my name's Jackie Faraday and I'm a senior scientist and senior education manager at the Hayden Planetarium at the American Museum of Natural History, which is why I'm particularly oddly qualified to talk to you about this specific topic. This is an image that was taken inside of the Hayden Planetarium while I was giving a public talk to about 400 people because that's about how many we can fit in and it was a sold out show where all of the stars are mapped very, very precisely by their Gaia parallaxes. So Gaia has given us the most precise astrometric map ever and they are colored they are colored by something specific. Anybody want to try and guess what they're colored by? And don't answer if you know the answer, because some people know. You can shout out anything. Not distance, not proper motion, both good guesses. Other aspects of stars, maybe. 
Nothing to do with the, the way they're moving. Something else about stars. Not brightness. What we got in the back? Metallicity. There's their stars colored by their chemistry. Most of them are kind of like the sun, but every now and again, you get some weirdos in there, which are particularly interesting to then go and fly around and fly to. This was a talk about interesting chemical signatures of stars, but all sorts of discussions can happen. You can sit in the planetarium with your colleagues and you have all sorts of great conversations. Now, very, very quickly through this, the way that we run the planetarium is with, um, with our planetarium is with a particularly fantastic piece of software called Open Space. You can all get a sticker, they're at the front, stickers, take them, enjoy them. This is a NASA funded open source piece of software that you can download yourselves and use on your laptop with a regular screen if you wanted to. But at this point, I'm going to show you how we use it within the planetarium as well. And I want to point you to something if this is like, what are you talking about? Why are you so interested in this? For the Astro 2020 white paper calls, myself and several colleagues in this room decided on a paper that we would put forth for the community to consider, and we called it ideas or immersive dome experiences for accelerating science, within which we propose this idea of combining various pieces of software that exist that run planetariums that could then be pulled together and used to drive astrophysical research forward. The software that I'm going to tell you about today and show you and demonstrate for you how we're getting this done combines open space. If it interests you, go to our website, say, uh, our website openspaceproject.com, and you can see all the details of what works there. And what we can do, well, this is a great piece of software for running a planetarium for the sole purpose of education. It was not intended to be used for astrophysical research for people like me, possibly people like you guys in the room that want to walk in and say, oh, I'm studying kinematic clusters. I want to see what they look like. I want to play. I want to ride around. I want to look around. That's not necessarily what it was made for. What's made for things like that is a software package you're going to hear from later from Alyssa Goodman called Glue. Also stickers, also swag, lots of good stuff, lots going on there. Glue is a great piece of software for that. Aladdin, another great piece of software. Some of us know these very well. If you're a grad student or a postdoc or a junior faculty or whatever, you run around with these pieces of software left, right, and center. Wouldn't it be great if those pieces of software could talk to the planetarium software so you could fluidly be inside of the planetarium flying around? That's exactly what we've gotten done. So this is an image, again, inside of the planetarium. This is a, an image that was taken with about 90 astronomers inside the day of a Gaia hack week where about 90 of the Gaia scientists were all together hacking the data and trying to find stuff, right? Like Gaia came out, those of you remember, it was like Christmas for astrometry. Boom, all of a sudden 1.5 billion parallaxes, proper motion, chemistry, all sorts of good stuff. And I made a promise to the DPAC team, to the Data Processing and Analysis Center team, that I would make it available for them to play with inside of the planetarium about six months prior to it being released. And this was the image of us showing it for the first time inside of the planetarium and flying around. It was pretty kick-ass. And what we then have tried to do is get that software package, get Gaia, Say, for instance, that you could play with in glue, which this is just me a little rendering for you of how you would play with this in glue. This is me playing with young stars near the sun, one of my particular favorite interests. And so Alyssa is going to tell you all about how you use glue later. Just download glue and play with it if you haven't already. But this is us with our new plugin. You can see that I've now opened up this open space viewer there. Uh, it comes up as a plugin. And in the background, running right here is open space. This is running on my laptop, not in the dome. It's running on my laptop. And so you can see there's, an, there's oh look, there's, there's open space running here. Glue is running here. This is me selecting how to translate my standard astronomer user tools over and into the planetarium software. And it's gonna happen uh, when I move this forward here, you're gonna see how I'm gonna send it over. Once you have the coordinates right, all of a sudden I'm gonna hit go. The stars get sent over, boom. You fluidly are running from playing with your regular software all over. 
Okay, it works. Why does it work? I have other videos of how it works, but I'm gonna to skip to why it works. And part of why it works is because people like this. And these are students on the um, far left, Lynn Sorenstrom, Emma Segelson. These are two students that came from us. That's my two minute warning. Uh, those are students that came to us from Sweden, where we have a very strong partnership with the visualization centers there. And Anders Yinerman, who's a longtime colleague of both Carter Emmert, who's here, who is one of the uh, fathers of open space, have come together to, um, uh, we collaborate with them and then we, we, um, we interest their master's students to come and work with us. And this group has helped us turn the planetarium into a workspace for astrophysics. And this is an image of what it looks like inside of the dome now. So this is two of the students working. All of a sudden, the screen of the planetarium becomes the screen of, of whatever science you were trying to do. It's another view, one of our software engineers running, this, running the program. You can see open space is running on the screen. Uh, and at the bottom right, what you can see on Micah's screen is glue that's running with a various number of windows, which we've sent over the data into the planetarium, we're fluidly having conversations. You're asking people about, well, have you ever looked at that open cluster? Maybe we can turn that on. Have you thought about this H2 region? Maybe that has something to do with your science. Imagine the kind of collaborative conversations that you have. Okay, last thing on this is that this also works with Worldwide Telescope. We just heard from David about how fantastic Worldwide Telescope is. And we also have a plugin to get that work to work within the planetarium. So, I'm ending there with maybe a minute for some for any questions that you can have, but know that you're not limited to just using your screen. You're not limited to the tools that you think you are with what you have on whatever Python, IDL, whatever you want to use. You can actually use facilities like this. And there's some of us in this room that are very invested in getting this into other planetariums, if not just the Hayden planetarium. Okay, that's it. Okay. Oh, question all the way to the back room. And it's been done. Hi there. Thank you. Um, I was wondering what facilities or requirements does a planetarium need to meet in order to be able to run this? Is it like they have to have certain software, certain hardware? Yeah, so that's a that's a good question. Oh, so I can repeat it. So the question is what kind of, what are the basically technical uh, specifications to be able to run this kind of software and do this kind of work? Carter, do you want to answer? Um, so you, what you need is a digital planetarium. So you need projection like this, this tiny, tiny computer, obviously. Um, and that is not an Evans and Sutherland system. And there are a lot of planetariums that are Evans and Sutherland systems, but they do not uh, support uh, putting open space on them. Digital planetariums are what you need, for sure. And then you really need to work with us uh, to just make sure it's going to work. So our open space team. Just real quick to raise your hand if you work at a planetarium. Oh my gosh, more people than I thought. Okay, raise your hand if you want to work in a planetarium. Okay, excellent. So I feel like there should be cross conversations happening in this room. That's it. Great. Thank you so much. On break now? Yeah. Okay. Start four or five, six. okay, we are on break now. And uh, Gordon, the timekeeper, says we can start at 4.05. Okay. So see you all back at 405. Go have those conversations. Don't talk to me. <laughs> sure. So I am one of the main organizers of Astronomy on Tap Baltimore. Yes. 